All right, so we are in business now. All right, so if you're just joining us, go ahead and get your audio set up. The directions are there for you on the screen. We also have a call-in number in case you're having any audio trouble. And I'll put that into the chat again um, just in case you missed it last time. So um, I would like to welcome... Oh, Earl has a question. Go ahead, Earl. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I think he was, yeah, I think we were just testing our mics. Okay, let's get going. Um, so welcome to the first webinar of the 2017 IGNIS season. We are so thrilled to have you join us today. IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do today, to ignite your curiosity and to spark your intellect. This series is brought to you by the Office of E-Learning and Open Education at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges, otherwise known as SBCTC. And your hosts today are myself, Alyssa Sells, and Mark Carbon. And we'll share our contact information with you at the end of the webinar. Our presenter today is Kelly Neeson. And our topic is how to build modules in Canvas using the principles of universal design for learning. And I think I forgot to switch the slide here, so we'll show you Kelly in his jester's hat here. A big thank you to Kelly for uh, agreeing to start us off this season and for sharing his knowledge and expertise with us this afternoon. We're pleased to have him back. He was a presenter from last year, so thanks to you, Kelly. I'd also like you all to note that our webinars will be captioned this season. And I'd like to thank a la carte for their real-time captioning services. And if you'd like to use those captions, just click on the CC button in the top right corner of the audio video panel. Or you can also use Control or Command F8 to open and Control or Command W to close the captioning window. And um, we have a list of keyboard shortcuts here. I'm going to throw those into the chat for you if you need them. Go ahead and grab them from there. And I also have an accessibility guide uh, for Collaborate if you have questions on the accessibility features in Collaborate. All right, so as a reminder, this webinar will be recorded. And um, you can access the recording on the ATL blog. And I will go ahead and put that into the chat as well. And uh, you can find more than just the recordings on the blog. You can also access uh, the recordings and resources from the webinar. You can find our schedule and any other IGNIS information um, is there. So I'll give you the URL for the full schedule also. So OK, you guys should be overloaded with um, URLs now. OK, so traditionally, we start the IGNIS webinars um, by running through just a few of the Collaborate tools. So we're going to go ahead and do that now. And then I'm going to turn it over to Mark to introduce Kelly. And I'm going to move through these next couple of slides kind of quickly because we're only going to be using a couple of the features today. We'll mostly be using uh, chat and polling. So here is a screenshot of um, the Collaborate interface. The whiteboard's where you're seeing the slides. Uh, the audio video panel is where um, my picture is. And then there's a list of participants there in the middle left. And on the bottom left is the chat. And we will be asking you to use uh, the chat today. OK, so here are some of the tools that you have access to in Collaborate. You can raise your hand when you ask a, to ask a question. And you can also type those questions into the chat. And um, today, we're going to have you just ask your questions as we're going along. So if you have a question, type it into the chat. And Kelly um, will, Mark or I will interrupt Kelly um, and uh, tell him that there's a question. We'll read that to him. Or you can raise your hand, and uh, we'll call on you, and you can ask your question yourself. Uh, be sure when you're speaking that you turn your talk button on, and that when you're not speaking that you have it turned off so we don't get excess background noise. 
And on the far left there, there's a little smiley face. You can use emoticons to um, indicate approval or maybe give a job well done. I think there's hands clapping, smiley faces, a few other things in there. And then the other tool that we want to use today is the polling tool. And that's that tool right in the middle with a little check mark in it. And we are going to use that on a couple of um, polls that Kelly has planned during the during the session, so um, make sure that you remember where that one's at. And I am going to wrap that up now and uh, turn it over to Mark to introduce Kelly. And I'm just going to get Kelly's slide pulled up here. So take it away, Mark. There we go. Yeah. So hello, everyone. Yep. <laughs> and you have to remember to hit the talk button. So I was going to say hi. I was just going to uh, remind you to do that. <laughs> <coughs> well, today, uh, you know, thanks for joining us this afternoon. And I have the pleasure of introducing someone I've been working with for uh, many, many years. And so um, today we have uh, Kelly Mewson, Clover Park Technical College. And he has. Uh, been supporting students and faculty in their teaching and learning for a number of years now. And he has also been an online instructor since 1999 and is currently teaching for, come on, <laughs> an eternity. Yeah, Jerry. Those who know him, he's uh, currently teaching for Tacoma Community College and Grace Harbor. And he's representing uh, Clover Park on the State Board of e Learning Council as well. And he has been a Canvas community coach for the last year, which has been uh, excellent for our system because we've benefited from that knowledge that he has uh, amassed. So thank you for kicking off our new season, Kelly, and uh, take it away. All righty. Thanks for all the kind words, uh, Mark. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you for everybody coming to listen to me talk. Um, the folks who do know me know that I love to talk. And so it's uh, gratifying to have a few people who are willing to listen for a few minutes. Uh, I, I imagine some of you will just bail after you get tired of hearing me for, after a few minutes. But that's all right. Um, our agenda today, I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, but we uh, have a brief introduction. We'll talk about the importance of modularization, the importance of consistency, the use of text headers and indentation, example models of uh, module structure, uh, the obligatory question and answer period, and then some additional resources that I'll make available to everybody. Go ahead and change slides for me, whoever's moderating. Um, so I think Mark introduced who the heck I am and why the heck I'm here fairly well. Uh, but I want to talk just for a second about my own UD UDL journey. And that actually started in 2008 when I was full-time faculty at Tacoma Community College. And I was in the right place at the right time because the college offered a full term workshop on universal design for learning. It was facilitated by Candice Rengarby. And uh, we would meet a couple of hours a day, a couple days a week throughout the quarter. And uh, I got to tell you that that was a um, eye-opening experience for me. I had already been interested in accessibility, and this was the other side of the coin, so to speak. And so it started my journey to learning UDL. And I do say journey because it's not a destination. Uh, UDL is very uh, dependent on digital technology. And I, even though that technology is advancing rapidly, I doubt if in my lifetime we'll reach the destination of full universal design. Um, so anyways, that's uh, where I started my journey in UDL. But I want to know a little bit about you folks. And so I've scheduled a couple polls for this slide. And the first one is, um, are you familiar with the principles of universal design? And use the polling button to just answer yes or no so I can get a feel for my audience here. All righty. Votes are coming in. 
Yep, I'll go ahead and publish those for you, Kelly. Yeah, I can see them on the screen here. But. Okay. So this is very good. Um, I'm sure some more of you might vote here in a second, but uh, judging by it, there are most... Go ahead, Alyssa. You start oh, I was just going to say Dawn was reporting in okay. that she has three um, votes. It saying looks yes. to me like most... Okay, great. Excellent. Um, that means that most of you are familiar with the concept of universal design for learning and universal design in general. And that's a good thing because I'm not going to talk about UDL theory or the principles of UDL. I just want to share with you how I have operationalized the principles of UDL in one specific area, and that's the Canvas modules. So I have another poll here. Um, I want to know how many of you organize your courses using the Canvas modules feature. And again, go ahead and use your yes and no buttons, and we'll see where we're at with this. Let me see. I'm at 18 out of 25. That's pretty good. Um, so yes, it looks like the majority of you are using modules in Canvas. And this is a really good thing. Uh, Mark mentioned that I'm a Canvas community coach. And I'm actually uh, sometimes rather dismayed by how many faculty show up in the community who don't use modules at all. And as we work through this, um, I hope that I can make uh, converts out of at least a few of the four of you who currently are not using modules in Canvas and be able to show you how important that is to your students' learning. Um, so that, that's really good. All right, let's go on to the next slide. So some quick definitions, and I don't need to spend a lot of time on this because you guys are familiar with UDL. But UDL stands for Universal Design for Learning, and the definition from the National Center for Universal Design, which I noticed that Alyssa put their website up in the chat window, um, is a set of principles for curriculum development that give all individuals equal opportunities to learn. And you're going to see me use the all caps, underlined, and bold all, all the way through this uh, presentation today, because that's one of the key importances of universal design for learning. Um, the Higher Education Opportunity Act of 2008 has a somewhat more uh, complex definition for UDL, and it means a specifically valid framework for guiding educational practice. And I really like that framework term in there because when you're using your modules and you design them using UDL principles, you are giving your students a framework for guiding their learning. Um, Part A of that definition says it provides flexibility in the way that information is presented to students. And Part B, which is very important to what I'm going to be talking about today, is that their definition includes that it reduces barriers to instruction, provides appropriate accommodation, supports and challenges, and maintains high achievement expectations for, again, all students. So um, I, I'm quite a fan of simple definitions, but in this case, I think I really like what the Higher Education Opportunity Act has said, and especially in regards to what we're going to be talking about today. OK. Accessibility has two components, accommodations 
and universal design. And I think we all know what accommodations are. It's providing an opportunity for disabled students to be able to have an equivalent um, educational opportunity. Universal design is intended to make sure that all students have an equal opportunity. And one of the great things about universal design for learning is that if you incorporate universal design principles in your course design, your curriculum development, and your instructional delivery, fewer of your students are going to need accommodations. In other words, one of the goals of universal design is, again, to make everything work for all students or as many students as is possible. All righty. I went ahead and decided that we needed to define modules because I think this is kind of important. And of course, we're talking about Canvas modules in this. But um, I googled modules and found this great little definition, standardized self-contained segment that with other such segments constitutes an educational course or training program. And I think this is really important. Canvas actually provides us a tool, modules, where we can standardize the segments of our instruction and use them to build an entire educational course or training program. And uh, it, it, it is very much worth our while in, in terms of student retention, student persistence, and student success to take advantage of the module tool that Canvas creates. All right, let's go on next one. Um, I have two guiding principles in my courses, and um, UDL helps me meet my guiding principles. And the first one is that all students must be able to know what they have to do how they have to do it, where they have to do it, and how they can get help when they need it. And my second principle is we want all of our students to be challenged by our curriculum and not challenged by the technology used to deliver our curriculum. And sometimes this can be a hard lesson for faculty to learn. Um, especially if they have a lot of technological expertise because they like to show that they have that technological expertise. And this was a tendency that I had to break myself of in my classes so that my students would be challenged by my curriculum and not by my clever uses of the technology. And by applying UDL principles to our module design, um, we're able to make it much easier for our our students to use the technology to get their learning. All righty. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the importance of modularization. And I'm going to start with the textbook mod model. And I know that this will probably not make happy any of you out there who are fans of nonlinear instruction, because textbooks are very linear. But textbook makes textbooks make a great model for developing our online courses. Um, for at least the last hundred years, if you open up a, almost any textbook, you're going to find a very familiar structure. One of the first things you're going to find in a textbook is a table of contents that lays out what students will find in their textbook. Um, your textbook is typically organized by chapters, and the chapters will typically open with an introduction. Uh, some of them will include learning outcomes or objectives for that chapter, uh, maybe a little brief uh, index of what the chapter includes. The uh, chapter of that textbook may be divided into sections, maybe not, but if they're divided into sections, you'll find that those sections of the chapters uh, have a commonality throughout the textbook. Um, I teach medical terminology, and uh, the chapters in my textbook are arranged around body systems. And so each chapter includes uh, a section on anatomy and physiology, and a section on diseases or pathology, 
um, a section on diagnosis and a section on treatment. <laughs> and every one of those body system chapters include those sections. A textbook will also typically include practice activities or exercises in each chapter and then some kind of a chapter summary and followed by a let's see how much you know little practice quiz. And this model works for students and it has worked for a very long time. It's something that we're all very familiar with because we grew up with it. We encountered our textbooks throughout K-12, throughout higher education, and that's a very comfortable model. And our module structure within a Canvas classroom should approximate those same organizing principles of our textbook and that we tend to organize our face-to-face -face sessions if we teach hybrid or if we teach fully face-to-face -face courses. We tend to structure our face-to-face -face sessions in much the same way as a textbook is structured. Yes, you might jump from chapter to chapter, but the way you organize the study units in the face-to-face -face session will tend to follow that same textbook model. And why? Because that's what we know, that's what we're comfortable with, and that's what our students are comfortable with. So we need to design our online courses exactly like we our textbooks and traditional classrooms are designed. And one of the principles for that is that everything that relates to and supports a specific unit of study should be included in that unit's module, whatever you're calling your modules. Uh, so that when a student, say, opens up the module on the um, skeletal system, they know that they'll find all the study materials that they need for the skeletal system. They'll find all of the learning activities that they need for the skeletal system. And they'll find all of the assessment activities that they need for the skeletal system. Um, this is just good universal design for our, our model, module structure. Let's go on next slide. Um, I found some great information from Boise State University. Um, apparently that's a school that very much believes in modules and they have some online resources for their online faculty that talk about modules. And um, one of the things they tell us is that a module structure is especially important in online learning environments as it provides an aid to the presentation and application of the online teaching and learning process. And here's the really cool part. It helps all of our students, of course, but it also aids our teachers in the delivery of instruction, in the development of their curriculum, in the design of their classrooms. Uh, that module structure can be a driver for all of those things. Let's go on to the next slide. Boise State also adds that often online students get a little bit lost and they don't understand what they're expected to do or where to find what they need to do. Remember one of my guiding principles from an earlier slide? But if the course follows a format that's recognizable and comfortable, then when the second week and subsequent weeks are consistent with that first module, they thereby become more effective for their learning. Um, so the students rely on that consistent structure in order to be comfortable in the classroom, again, so that they can be challenged by your curriculum and not by the technology used to deliver it. Next slide. Boise State goes on by saying, by incorporating the same types of components in each course module, students quickly pick up the course's rhythms and patterns and have a better idea of what to expect than if the course were designed using a varying structure. And we're going to talk about those um, rhythms and those patterns and the same types of components in some subsequent slides. But here's a very interesting stat that I grabbed off of Penn State. They did a student survey, an online student survey in spring of 2016. 
And uh, there was some great information gathered in that survey, but there was one point made that is of particular interest to us today, and that was that 43.48% of students preferred modules as the home page in their Canvas courses. Um, and as you know, there's, uh, I think, uh, five, six different options that we have for what we want to be our home page in our Canvas classrooms, including designing a page um, ourselves, and that's what I do uh, personally. But this was an eye-opener to see that 43% of the students prefer seeing modules on the, as the home page. And I find that this is even more appropriate for what we're talking about today because if you set the modules as your home page and they're not particularly well structured and designed, then that technology becomes again a barrier to the student's learning. So I have one more poll. I didn't put it on this slide in time to get it to, uh, uh, yes, I see that I have a question. Alyssa? Yeah, sorry to interrupt you, Kelly. There's just a question in the chat that's asking um, about the Penn State comparison. Um, and it says, is that because their comparison is, comparison is recent activities by default? So um, just wondering what that comparison was made to, Lisa's asking. Um, in reading the study, they didn't go into a lot of detail of what other options the faculty are generally using at Penn State, but they listed the preferences for all of the options that are available as a home page in Canvas. So I suspect there's a wide variety of home page use at Penn State, and I, I think that might be true even more so because Penn State's been using Canvas now for a little more than two years. And so I suspect that, that a wide variety of home pages are being used. We see a wide variety of home page use on our campus. Um, and yeah, somebody put in there, uh, because I prefer something to nothing also. Absolutely. I don't know many people who use recent activities unless they're brand new to Canvas and don't re realize that there's another alternative. Um, I did. I do have another um, poll question here, um, and it's based on learning this result from Penn State. Is how many of you are using modules as your home page in, in Canvas? If you could uh, just check a yes or a no on that, I'm really curious about this from a personal perspective. We started out almost 50-50, but not using it has gained just a little bit of traction, but not a lot. I am guessing that your statistics pretty much mirror what we see on our campus now, six to seven. Um, we do see quite a few faculty using modules as the home page, maybe half. I see some advantages to that, but I got to tell you, I still prefer my home page that I uh, that I designed myself. Part of that is just because of quality matters, training on, uh, you know, providing your students with a nice warm welcome. And yeah, they could click, click on a welcome message at the top of the modules page, but I think having them first opening up a Canvas course and seeing a nice welcome message works for me. Looks like there's some um, other um people agreeing with you here in the chat, Kelly, that um, Zach says he encourages instructors yeah. to use context a context-sensitive landing page, um, but many instructors like the slower upkeep of the module's home page. Um, Jerry Lewis says um, some have a custom home page to start and then switch to modules after a week or so. Um, Dawn reported in that there, no one in the lab right now is using uh, modules as their home page. Uh, Dana says that her home page gives weekly schedule um, information link, and links to modules. Irene says that she uses a custom home page then switches over after a few weeks. Uh, Nathan agreed. And I think there is somebody else that I missed up a little 
earlier that said they also used um, a customized home page. So looks like you're in good company with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. I just wanted to get a feel for what everybody else was doing. And actually, I uh, I create a new home page for each module. Actually, I'm pre-created, and I just you know load them when the time comes. So that makes that. Uh, that work a lot easier. But I was just curious, and thank you everybody for responding to that. We can move on to the next slide now. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about minimum recommended module content. At a minimum, each module should include an introduction or overview that includes the, the module's learning objectives. Again, this is taken right straight out of the textbook model that everybody is comfortable with, telling folks, well, why are we in this module? What are we going to learn? What's going to be expected of us? I think that's a very important uh, item to include in every module. Again, all the learning materials for that module, all the learning activities for that module, all the assessments for that module so that students aren't having to um, go back and forth and back and forth to other areas to try and find uh, the handouts, the, the quizzes or practice activities, the assessments, et cetera, to have them all in the single module. And there's other things that I, I strongly recommend having in a module, um, practice activities a mini schedule for the module so that students can keep on track because as we all know online students it's one of the, the hugest challenges for them especially in a fully online course is staying on track and so repeating just that module schedule or that chunk of the course schedule in the module um, really helps the students keep on track. I also really support the idea of a summary or a review at the end of the module before they engage in, if you use a module assessment of some kind, you know, a module exam, having a summary or review there to help cement the learning in the students' minds. I think that's a very nice item to include at the module level also. So let's go on to the next slide. So one of the most important UDL principles in module design is consistency. Uh, consistent module design will greatly aid, again, all students in what they have to do, how they have to do it, and where they have to do it. Um, as we saw earlier in the slides with the comments from Boise State, that consistent module design helps the students keep on track, keep engaged throughout the quarter because they know what to expect as they go into each new module. And by consistency, I mean a consistent naming. And we'll go into each of these items in a little more detail. Consistent location and placement. I gave you a list on the previous slide of the minimum content that should be included in a module. Students should find that minimum content in the same location in every module whenever possible. Consistent ordering. And something some of you may never have considered is consistent scheduling. And we'll talk about that in a little bit here on that slide. Uh, let's go ahead. Consistent naming. And, and really, a rose is not always a rose when we don't always call it a rose. Um, I like to design my courses to what I call the lowest common denominator. And I don't mean that in any kind of an offensive manner. But my goal is to make sure that all of my students know what they need to do, where they need to do it, how to get to it, etc. And one of the ways that I do that is with consistent naming of my modules. Doesn't matter what kind of module structure you're using, if you're calling them modules, you know, module one, module two, etc. 
call them module one, two, three, four every time. Don't throw in a different name. You know, module one, unit two, uh, chapters 13 and 14, and then you skip to here's the assessments for this course or something along those lines. Consistently name your modules. Um, this is a real accessibility principle, too. This helps your students who are using screen reader technology to get to where they need to be in the modules page as quickly as possible. Consistent naming of learning materials and resources. And I actually um, go so far as to reflect the module name in the content name. So I will uh, say something along the line, title something along the lines of Module 1, Handout 1, Module 1, Handout 2, Module 1, Handout 3. Um, again, this consistency is, is, besides being a UDL feature, it's also an accessibility feature. It makes it easier for students who use screen reading technology, students with uh, certain learning disabilities. It helps your bottom 10% of your students find what they need and keep on track, and it makes your OCD uh, top 10% of your students very happy because they can move through your course much more efficiently and not waste time hunting for stuff, which, you know, they're busy earning their 120% and they don't want to spend time looking for things, so having that consistent naming really helps them. Also, consistent naming of text headers. Um, that naming consistency should be reflected across all modules whenever possible. Okay, let's move on. I'm trying to judge my time here. Uh, you have, Kelly, you have about 11 minutes left on the timer, but we still have a little extra time after that. And then Earl has yeah. a comment um, in the chat. He just said Hi, Earl. Um, that faculty tend to be consistent with their own use from course to course and quarter to quarter, but that the challenge has always been to get all the different divisions and faculty on board with even the basics of consistent design use of, of, of campus. Uh. Earl makes a really good point there because, um, you know, we as individual faculties, we can make our courses consistent and um, all of the courses I teach have exactly the same look, structure, feel. Um, I use the same color schemes, everything. Um, but I know for a fact that within the programs that I teach for, that consistency isn't carried over. And um, Cindy and I here at Clover Park have tried to convince programs to apply a consistent structure and design and naming to all of the courses in a program, but boy, that, that's a tough battle to fight, but it would sure be wonderful for the students if when they, you know, finish a course this quarter and they start a course next quarter, they know exactly what that new course is going to look like if it's in the same program. So good point, Earl. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, Students should expect to find similar items in the same places throughout the duration of the course. And the placement of learning materials and activities should reflect the logical flow of student learning within the course. Now, I know not everybody's a fan of linear learning, um, but even in nonlinear learning, there's a logical flow to how you present the information to your students, even when you give them some control on what they're going to access and when and what path they're going to take for their learning. Um, I, I'm a student of constructivism, so I'm also quite a fan, actually, of uh, linear learning. And I was just doing, looking at a study here this week about linear versus nonlinear, and there's some good demographics on who prefers what. And, K-12 students, especially K-6, really prefer linear structure to their learning. Um, students from 20 to 30 age bracket, which a lot of you have if you work at community colleges, um, are a little split. Some of them really like nonlinear, some of them really like linear, and the students over 30 up to, you know, my um, beloved age um, tend to prefer linear. So. Just throwing that out there. However you choose to sequence the learning in your modules, that sequence should be the same in 
every module and of course there are going to be exceptions for example um, if you're going to throw a midterm exam in there that's something that's almost extra modular when you're talking about modules as a unit of study but you can develop a module that is just for a midterm exam just for a final exam just for a capstone project or a final essay or whatever and the important thing is to make sure that everything else about that module is as consistent as possible with what the rest of the module structure looks like in your course and then reference those modules so that students know, you know, say uh, by the third week of the quarter, they know that there's going to be a midterm exam coming up. And even if you hide the module, they're going to expect to find that in its own module. And maybe with a nice introduction and uh, some general instructions to follow the, the uh, structure that you've used in the rest of your modules. All right, next slide. Consistent scheduling. Um, this is guaranteed one of the biggest challenges for online students keeping on track. Uh, this is a self-confessed and admitted challenge for online students, even better students. So whenever possible, and I know it's not always possible, design your modules to be of a consistent duration. Um, you know, some people like to use a week on each module or a week on each chapter. Some people like to divide their quarter up into four units of study um, where they um, have chunked up the delivery of instruction, you know, their curriculum into four components. You know, so you may have a unit one with uh, the first eight chapters of a textbook, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another thing that's really helpful for students for keeping on track is to schedule regular due dates on the same days of the week across all modules. And again, of course, there's exceptions to that. There has to be, depending on your curriculum and your, your teaching style and the topics that you're teaching. But whenever it's possible, now for my, my courses, I, I teach a knowledge-based course, so it makes that job a lot easier. But um, my modules run from 12 a.m. Monday to 12 p.m. the follow, uh, 1159 p.m. the following Monday and overlap on Mondays. And I have half of my assignments due by midnight Friday and the other half due by midnight Monday. Those dates or days of the weeks are just my choice. But what this does for the students is that you know they know okay it's Wednesday hey I'm gonna I'm gonna have a discussion I need to post by Wednesday or this is Thursday we always have our quiz here on Thursday or this is Monday and I have to have my uh, writing assignment done by Monday or I have to have my um, my pre work on the car bumper I'm repainting done by Monday whatever those. By scheduling things on the same days of the week when possible, it creates that rhythm that Boise State was talking about in the course and really helps your students keep on track. And I see this in, in my own courses that I teach. I see students all over the place in the first week, sometimes the first two weeks, but by the third week they've all settled down to the routine and I have very few students who are turning in work late. Use of text headers and indentation. Yay! Modules include the ability to put text headers in and to indent the content that's under the text headers. And for people using screen reader technology, this is wonderful because built into that structure of text headers and indentation are heading levels that uh, screen readers recognize. So first level text headers are always going to be um, header level two because in the Canvas uh, model, the title of the module is header level one. Um, and then indentation of content under a text header greatly helps all students identify and focus on a specific section of a, mo of a module. Um, I saw a hand raise or heard a hand raise. Who has this? Go ahead, whoever raised their hand. 
We actually don't have anybody with hands up right now. Um, oh. There's just a couple co couple comments in the chat. Okay, so you're that good. could have been. Yeah, I'm following the comments, so that must that could have been my email. <laughs> That's all right. Me. I, mean, I should have turned that off. Um, <laughs> um, the the thing with having your content indented under a text header and then consistently named. Um, you know, besides the advantage for students using screen reading technology is that um, all of your students can quickly go to, say, the assignments in module three and get to what they actually want very quickly without, again, having the technology become a barrier to her, them. I need to move on fast, so let's switch slides. I've put together uh, some quick examples and models, uh, but what I want to stress here very strongly is I'm also a believer in the KISS principle, which is, you know, keep it simple, stupid, to the degree possible. Um, reflect on how your textbook is structured, because if you structure your modules to reflect what the students see in the textbook, it becomes very comfortable with them. We're always faced with that challenge of how to best segment and sequence our curriculum, especially when we're teaching something new. You know, how do we fit all of this curriculum into a 12-week quarter or worse, an eight-week summer quarter? Um, this is always a challenge. And one of the tricks for uh, getting through that challenge before you even start developing your curriculum or as a first step is to create an outline. And uh, that will help you decide how to chunk up your curriculum. Well, that outline then becomes an awesome tool for developing your module structure and designing your actual course. Let's go on into the next. So here's just a quick uh, visual, module by module, or chapter by chapter, or week by week, et cetera. Uh, the brown bars, of course, are modules. The blue bars are text headers. And then the black text is just the content within a module. And this is a very basic structure, and I think it makes sense. But you can see that how when the students know they need to accomplish some work in module one, it becomes very clear to them where they need to go within that module to get to what they need to do next. And you'll notice that this example reflects that consistent naming structure that I, or principle that I talked about earlier. Let's go on to the next one. This is a unit by unit. Uh, I talked about that earlier, where you may divide your course into four or five units. Um, again, the brown bars are the modules. The blue bars are the first text header level. And then the black bars are a second text header level. And you can see that Canvas really allows you to follow that outline structure that people are familiar with very easily within setting up your modules in Canvas. Let's go on to the next one. Project by project, uh, many of our courses I teach for technical and professional college, so a lot of our um, courses uh, use projects. Uh, so you can have uh, your module des design structured around projects using basically the same thing that, um, you know, same tricks that I described in the other examples. Um, we have a, a program here at our college that is doing something completely different in modules. As a technical college, uh, there's a lot of challenges and issues around converting hourly time to credit uh, time at our school. And so in some of our programs, our students may be taking six courses in one quarter. But the reality is, is that they walk into the same classroom every day and sit there for six hours with the same teacher, even though they're taking six courses. And one of our programs has taken to cross-listing all of the courses for that quarter into one Canvas shell. And then their module structure, the titles of their modules, reflect the name of the individual courses. And then they used a consistent uh, structure in each one of those modules so that when students are, you know, I need to go do the assignment for uh, this course, they can go to that mo appropriate module and find that content very quickly. And I'm very excited about that one because the faculty came up with that example themselves. Uh, next. Um, oh, good. I, I'm, I'm actually 
back on schedule. Some final tips. I think this first one is, is hugely important. Um, if each module includes the files, the pages, the discussions, the assignments, the quizzes, etc., for that module's content, then hide those contents and uh, content areas in the course navigation menu. This is one area where choice is not an advantage to your students. Um, I know we're, we're used to the concept in information technology that there are many paths to paradise or nirvana. But the reality is that for a lot of students, having too many places to look for things actually makes their navigation of your courses and keeping on track a lot more difficult. Um, the other thing is use consistent item numbering on a text header. Uh, you might have noted that um, in some of the examples we just saw that it was lecture one, lecture two, lecture three, et cetera, handout one, handout two, handout three, et cetera. Um, this is particularly helpful for students with certain learning disabilities. And the reality is that it actually helps all students keep on track with where they were in a module so they know where to go next when they come uh, back to the module. This is a feature request we see quite often in the Canvas community is the faculty wishing that there was a way, and students uh, wishing that there was a way that Canvas would document where they last were in their classrooms, you know, a check mark at a module, a different bit of highlighting, a uh, bit, bit of highlighting on a, on a particular piece of content, something along those lines so that students can better keep track of where they left off because they're not going to spend all day every day in the classroom going through their studies. They're going to pop in for an hour, two hours. They're going to pop back out. They're going to come back in. That keeping track of where they left off and where they need to pick it up at is very important for them. And numbering the items and that, that logical naming structure, that consistent naming structure, really helps students be able to do that easily. Uh, and one of the other things, you know, if you code using HTML, navigation buttons can be really helpful, you know, uh, so that students can jump to where they need to go from the bottom or top of a page, wherever they're at at the current time. Uh, this just makes uh, it so much easier for students because while a table of contents is a handy puppy, um, you can't just walk into Canvas and turn the pages to the middle of the book and hunt for the last one you were at like you can with a textbook. Um, so having um, navigation buttons or even content navigation links built into pages can be incredibly helpful for your students. Next slide. Um, I'm not a big fan of don'ts because, you know, again, we all have, uh, there's a lot of paths to nirvana. Um, but I've been uh, the e-learning coordinator at Clover Park for eight years now, and this is something that we have to support with both students and faculty a lot, and it's very sad, and that is don't organize your modules by the content type. In other words, don't have a module for handouts and a module for websites and a module for links and a module for assignments and a module for quizzes, et cetera, et cetera. And I've even seen examples where the faculty will have created modules for all of those content types and then also include in weekly modules. You know, so you'll have a module for handouts, then you'll have a week one module, week two module, and then maybe a module with uh, URLs to helpful websites, and then a couple more weekly modules. This kind of structure is a nightmare for the students. 
It's not at all accessible. Um, what happens then is, you know, this, uh, the instructor has told the students, read the handout for this week. They have to go search around until they find that handout. And typically, they're not logically named. You know, not the week one handout one. It's uh, some particular topic name. Um, and then after you finish reading the handout, I want you to take this practice quiz. So then they have to go hunt around through the module list for the one that has the quizzes, and then try to find the quiz for that uh, module. So this is this is just a nightmare for students, and it is uh, only barely accessible. And that screen readers will eventually get uh, a handicapped student to the right spot, but it's going to take a lot of searching. And uh, using screen reading technology is challenging enough and takes up enough extra time for a student that. Uh, for my my from my perspective, this is not accessible at all. And the other side of this same coin is that it's horrible to review, revise, or update by the teachers. The same teachers we see using this structure come into us to complain that, oh, somehow I ended up with two copies of the week three quiz in my class, and half my students have taken it in one copy, and the other half of my students have taken it in another copy, and I need you to fix this for me. Um, and we do fix it for them, and then um, we try to convince them to try to use a little more logical structure, because that's one of the negative results that can happen from organizing your classrooms this way. Um, the other thing is, you know, I, I know most teachers are just like I am. I think hardly a quarter goes by where I don't change something in my online classrooms. Um, and I think most of us are the same way. Uh, a, a classroom is not a destination, or a course is not a destination any more than UDL is. Uh, we're always looking for a way to do it better and make sure that more of our students succeed. Well, a well-organized and structured uh, classroom that utilizes a well-organized module structure, it makes it so easy to find what you needed to review or what you want to revise or what you need to update um, because you don't have stuff scattered everywhere in a haphazard order. It just makes it so much easier for us as teachers. And as we all know, we, we don't have a lot of spare time as teachers. And we do like to make things better in our classroom. Um, next slide. So one of the things is that in reality, to sum this up, in reality, modules and applying these module principles to your online Canvas classroom will be a primary driver for your entire course design process. I mentioned earlier, when you start your curriculum development process, you create an outline. It's a nice way to get down how you want to deliver your curriculum to your students. Well, that same outline can then become your module structure, and it will then drive how you design the entire rest of your course. And you'll see yourself, even if you don't know the principles of UDL, directly, you will see yourself applying those principles in the design of the rest of your classroom. Um, and because of that role of modules in course design, you will in promote inclusive course design for your students. And as I mentioned on the previous si uh, slide, a final not-so-secret advantage it also makes the teacher's life so much easier. And we need all the help we can get. So I just, at three seconds, let's go to the close up here. Anybody yeah, have Kelly, questions? There actually Next is slide, um, a question here in the chat from Earl. And he asks um, if you have any suggestions on how to create institutional movement toward a more standardized, more standardized use of the LMS. Question mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Earl, uh, good luck. Um, one of the things we, we had moderate success with, and I, OK, not even moderate. It was uh, the only bit of success we've had, is to tackle this by program. And that's uh, going to be a lot easier for us as a technical college than I think it would be for, say, Pierce as an academic college. 
Um, but if you can get your find a champion program that has embraced online learning and teaching and work with some of their more adventurous faculty to develop a template and then make that template available to the faculty in that program. You'll get your champions using that template right away, and then you'll get the added benefit that students will be uh, coming into a class at the start of the quarter, and they'll go, hey, how come your Canvas class doesn't look like Dr. Jones's? We really liked Dr. Jones's last year. It was really easy to use, and that's a big driver to change for faculty. So um, you know, that, that's, that, it's an uphill battle. It is a battle you'll never uh, you know, completely win unless you're at one of those few schools where the administration does have the willingness to you know, make it so, and I'm not even sure that's always a good idea. But yeah, it's an uphill battle, Earl. Yep, Stu, academic freedom, that's, uh, that's the driver. So I have provided um, some additional resources here. Um, and you'll notice that I've applied UDL principles to this entire slideshow. Well, these additional resources, the underlined text is an active link for those of you who get this slideshow in the electronic version. And below that is the actual UDL or URL so that if you only get a paper copy of this page, you'll be able to enter the address into your browser. Uh, CAST and the UW Center for Universal Design are excellent resources, as is Cheryl Bergstaller's book. Cheryl is part of the, well, she, she's in charge of the U Do It Center at the U of W, and her book, Universal Design in Higher Education, is a wonderful resource if you want to learn more about how to apply UDL to your classrooms. And then I put my email address down there anytime you have questions, comments, concerns, you want to just tell me I don't know what in the heck I'm talking about, I don't care. Um, there's my email address and I'm, I'll be happy to hear from you. And, and All right, thanks you. so much, Kelly. I went ahead and um, pasted those into the chat as well, just in case anyone wanted to look at them right now and didn't have time to write them down. This will um, get posted to the ATL blog site, so um, you will have access. And I. I think you probably all had the chance to download uh, the PowerPoint when you when you logged in, so hopefully you snagged a copy of that. Um, I think most of our questions were asked during, so I'll just go ahead and close us out because we're just a minute over time. Um, thank you so much, Kelly, uh, for joining us today. It was great. Um, here is um, a promo for our next IGNIS. Um, we'll be meeting again on Thursday, April 6th, and uh, we'll be joined by Allison Green, who's going to talk on the topic of becoming a more culturally responsive campus. And Allison's actually here today. So Allison, looking forward um, to hearing what you have to say on that. I think it's a great topic. So please do join us um, from 2 to 3 p.m. on Thursday, April 6th. And um, here's contact information for myself and uh, my co-host, Mark Carbon. And um, I'll just close us with um, a thank you and for you to note that all of our IGNIS content is licensed under a Creative Commons uh, 4.0 attribution. So you're free to take it and reuse it should you like to. Uh, Mark, any parting thoughts or words before we sign off? Yeah, thank you everybody for showing up and thank you Kelly for kicking us off. Yeah, thanks again Kelly. Any final thoughts from you? Oh, I'm just excited for Allison Green's uh, <laughs> at the next one because uh, I've watched two of Mark Lentini's uh, presentations uh, on that topic and I know he's mentioned her many times in those presentations so I'm excited to see what, uh, what she's going to share with us. Yep. All right, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and turn off our um, recording now. And um, if you want to hang out for just a second to ask any additional questions, please feel free.